even is this? How, you, you would think after a year I would learn how to work the fireplace. I just... I mean, I don't even have a fireplace. Jeez. Oh, oh, okay, here it is. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Year Was the podcast all about today that gives you just enough information to effectively be that guy at the party, causing all your friends to question. Hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? We're in the middle of a pandemic. I'm your host, Michael Montalvo, and for the next few minutes, we will swim through the river of time to find out what makes today truly unique. In this episode, we examine the events that occurred December 9th. Today, I thought we would do the holiday episode for the year. I don't know if it's the only one I'll be doing. I haven't checked the rest of the month for topics yet, but I will try to get more in as long as they line up okay. So sit back and listen to this thing because it's going to be a story. Here it is. The first Charles Schultz peanut strip was published October 2nd, 1950. In it, the world was introduced to Charlie Brown as he walks by Shermie and Patty, as they call him good old Charlie Brown, only to add how I hate him after he has left the panel. That's all it took to win over millions of people. Over the next 15 years, we saw Schultz add characters and expand his universe of the unnamed town Charlie Brown and Friends called home, creating a world readers could visit daily in the paper as if visiting old friends or hanging out with their buddy down the street. The strip grew to such popularity that a documentary about it and its creator, Charles Schultz, was suggested, but then something happened. The year was 1965, and on this day, December 9th, a Charlie Brown Christmas first aired on CBS, beginning its legacy of being shown at least once a year since it was first broadcast. This topic is discussed frequently this time of year, and for the episode, I will primarily reference the untold story behind A Charlie Brown Christmas by Carolyn Halliman from Town & Country Magazine, and How A Charlie Brown Christmas Almost Wasn't by Jennings Brown from The New York Magazine. So what's the story of A Charlie Brown Christmas? Well, to tell you that, we have to talk about producer Lee Mendelson. Mendelson had tried and failed to get a documentary about Schultz made, but despite the failure of this documentary, the cast of Peanuts made it onto the cover of the April 9, 1965 cover of Time magazine. McCann Erickson, Coca-Cola's ad agency, saw the cover and then immediately recognized the potential of a holiday special and approached Mendelssohn about producing one. According to the articles I read, Mendelssohn then lied about discussions he had had with Schultz and agreed to produce the special for the company. In reality, Schultz had no knowledge of any special or even talks ever taking place. He only found out when Mendelssohn called to tell him that they had sold the idea for a Charlie Brown Christmas. When he asked him, what is that? He was given the response, something you're going to write tomorrow which is a pretty big order. Seeing the task in front of them, they brought in animator Bill Melendez. Melendez, whose other credits include many Disney films, such as Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Dumbo, was originally hired on back when Mendelssohn was working on the documentary to animate a two-minute segment. He was brought over to the special, which turned out to be a slightly bigger project, and the three men would meet in Schultz's office to discuss the special. It was in this meeting that Mendelssohn would bring to the attention of the group his desire to use the fir tree by Hans Christian Andersen as a partial inspiration for the show. The idea was to use a sad tree that was essentially the Charlie Brown of trees. They worked out the story details and wrote an outline, then sent it to the ad agency who, upon receiving it, told the trio they had six months to deliver a finished product. But work was slow. Working furiously against the clock, the team used untrained child actors to fill the roles of the Peanuts gang, who frequently used an advanced vocabulary, feeding dialogue to them line by line and sometimes syllable by syllable. Three months into production, the team that they had gathered was still working with black and white illustrations. When the agency sent a representative down to report on the special's progress, he told the crew he wouldn't tell the agency what he thought, 
as he was sure they would shut them down if he did. The trio assured him that they would be successful and that the entire show would look and work better with the addition of color and music. The music that was chosen has become famous in its own right, written by none other than Vince Guaraldi. Guaraldi was another that had initially signed on to work on the documentary but was brought over to the new production. His song, Cast Your Fate to the Wind, was initially chosen for the opening. If you listen to the song, you can hear the early elements of what would come to define the world of Schultz. But it was deemed too slow, and so he sat down in his home and wrote, Christmas Time is Here. CBS did not care for Guaraldi's jazz, however, but production stood by him. Unfortunately, this would not be the only objection the team had to deal with. The laugh track was suggested but ultimately not used, and Schultz himself suggested Linus read from the Gospel of Luke. No one had animated anything from the Bible before, and Mendelssohn's fear was that it would simply not work. But he would later retract his statement, saying, That ten-year-old kid who recited that speech from the Bible was as good as any scene from Hamlet. Despite the obstacles, the team finished a special and showed it to CBS, whose general consensus was one of disappointment, calling the whole thing amateurist. Because it had already been produced and the TV guides had already been printed, it was allowed to air with the assumption that it would flop. But when it did air, the exact opposite happened. Ratings and reviews were beyond what anyone had expected, and the show would eventually go on to win a Peabody Award, with CBS ordering four more specials. I think people just found something to identify with in Charlie Brown, and that's what has made the show endure and remain. When Apple acquired the rights to Peanuts for their Apple TV+, Plus, they pulled the special from TV broadcast, instead preferring to exclusively stream it on Apple TV, making 2020 the first time in 55 years that it would not air. However, backlash from this decision, and one's previous not to air The Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown in October, and the almost cancellation of a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving in November, prompted Apple to relent and allow the specials airing. And I think that's a good thing. The world could use a bit more Charlie Brown. That's going to do it for us today. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, give us a rate and a review. That helps me out and helps steer this in a direction that is hopefully good for all. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the Year Was audio version on your podcast app of choice. You can find me on social media and at YouTube at the Apple Cider Club. And as always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.